Great. Thank you, Andy. Um, yeah, as Andy mentioned, I'm um, working here at NCAR closely with Daniel Kennedy, um, Katie Dagan, and Dave Lawrence on this project. Um, and you've probably heard them talk about it, but we're working on developing methods for calibrating the community land model, CLM, globally. Um, and so today I'm going to just get kind of get into some of the tests we've been doing and because um, I'd really like to get some feedback on some of these under the hood um, decisions that get made that we don't get to talk to other folks about that often. So looking forward to feedback um, from this community. Um, so Nina set this question up really well. There's a lot of uncertainty in how much carbon the land surface is um, can serve as a sink and the carbon uptake from the land service in our uh, future projections really influences how um, we how well we can project uh, future climate simulations and this uncertainty across model for, across different models is due in part due to structural uh, differences, but also due to parameter uncertainty as well. And so constraining some of this parametric uncertainty will help um, constrain our future projections. And I think for a long time, we've existed in this space where we were um, limited by computational constraints on how large our ensembles could be, which limited the number of parameters we could explore or which um, observations we could pull in. Um, and more recently, some of those computational constraints are being alleviated and we can run larger ensembles. And also importantly, machine learning has really demonstrated to itself to be a very valuable tool for these high dimensional data-driven problems like parameter estimation. Um, so we're, here we're gonna apply um, techniques that leverage some of the um, emerging machine learning tools to calibrate the model. Um, there's a lot of infrastructure work that goes into making these types of experiments possible. And Katie Dagan and Daniel Kennedy have um, you know, put years of work into making, into preparing CLM to be able to run these types of simulations. Um, first, they pulled out all of the parameters in the land model, all, but um, many, over 200 parameters in the land model, um, and developed some infrastructure to run fast spin up and generate these large perturbed parameter ensembles with, and also Im improved computational efficiency along the way. And so because of all this uh, groundwork that they've laid, we they were able to run a one at a time ensemble where each parameter was run at its minimum and maximum value. Um, and they set those ranges as well. And so we've learned a lot from this, identifying which parameters are influential and then can move on to this phase two where we start um, quantifying parameter uncertainty and work towards a calibration methodology. Um, so for our calibration methods, um, this workflow is gonna look really familiar to many of you. We first generate a perturbed parameter ensemble, identify the observational targets that we're um, trying to calibrate to, define our metrics or our cost function, um, and then train some surrogate models, some use machine learning to uh, build an emulator, and then use that emulator to explore the parameter space and constrain the posterior distributions on our parameters. And it's likely that we have to repeat this process you know, several multiple times before we have sufficiently constrained posterior distributions and can move towards um, optimization. And that might you know, look like MCMC or something like that. Uh, so this is our overall approach, but I'm just going to focus in on these two uh, aspects of the methodology because I think there's a lot of decisions that get made in here um, that might influence how successful our calibration um, is. So I'm going to think about how we construct this emulation task and what impacts that has on calibration. And if I have time for it, I can share why I think that some of those decisions influence the accuracy of our emulator predictions. Um, but before I provide some more information or lay out that experimental design a bit more, I want to just uh, give an overview of our ensemble and how and the tools we're working with. Um, so we identified 32 parameters in the community land model CLM 
um, that were influential on leaf area index um, and also GPP. We then sampled that 32 dimensional parameter space using a Latin hypercube and ran 500 ensemble members or unique parameterizations of the model um, after spin up from 1850 to 2014. And these were run offline uh, using reanalysis atmospheric forcings. Um, I should also mention that they're run on a sparse grid. I don't have time to get into that, but it helps improve our computational efficiency and makes this large ensemble possible. Um, and so here I'm just showing the spread in this ensemble. The default model parameterization is this black point. Um, in these are just global mean, LAI, and GPP. Um, and so we're just by adjusting these parameters, there's a really large uh, spread in the global, oops, sorry, global um, uh, GPP and LAI. This is roughly where our observational target might be. These are, we're still thinking about how to uh, really robustly quantify observational uncertainty in, in these types of uh, calibration projects. So this is likely under, this black, this green square is likely uh, too small, but um, roughly we should be down, somewhere down here. Um, so because these types of experiments are so computationally expensive, um, it's common in calibration methods to train a surrogate model. And the point of the surrogate model is just to um, be able to explore this parameter space more rigorously uh, without running an infinite number of uh, CLM simulations. Um, so for those not familiar with this method, you run a sort of a sparse sampling of the parameter space uh, through um, the forward model or CLM in this case, and then train some machine learning tool, emulator, surrogate model, these are all interchangeable, um, to build this surface. Um, and that surface then gives us this computationally cheap, fast way to evaluate different com parameter com combinations. I've heard about this many times throughout the uh, workshop, but um, that once the emulator is trained and built, we can use it to assess parameter sensitivity, detect interactions and nonlinearities, and then I'm going to talk about its use in calibration or optimization. Okay, so now getting into um, you know what a typical experimental design might look like. Um, first step, we define our observational target. Here, I'm going to focus just on leaf area index. Um, you typically have to do some form of spatial and temporal aggregation. Um, that might just be a global mean on the simple side. Uh, um, you know, you can make this as complex as you want, start using EOFs or different encoder decoder tools. Um, for this simple example, I'm just going to show the biome. I'm, I'm aggregating to the biome level, which is like tropical forest, tundra, um, boreal forest, etc. The third step is to then define some error metric. Um, this could be root mean square error, pick your favorite metric. Here, I'm just using the bias squared over the standard deviation of the observations. Um, and then we have to construct our cost function. And so this is just some weighted uh, combination of different metrics. Uh, for this example, I'm just using the um, nine different biomes. I'm taking the error, the this error metric in each biome and just summing across the nine biomes, treating them all equally. Um, it's just a really simple um, cost function for this to demonstrate um, this experiment. And then we train an emulator and this emulator relates the input parameter space to the error in our cost function, to the total error there. Um, and we're using a Gaussian process emulator, which is a very simple, easy to train tool. Um, it's very flexible. And I'm showing just the validation of that emulator here. So I train the emulator using 450 of my ensemble members, and then I validate it on the 50 ensemble members that I um, hid during training. And that's shown here. So see what the actual model output error, uh, total uh, cost function error um, is shown on the X. And then what the emulator predicts is on the Y, um, and we want this to be on the one-to-one -one line. It's reasonable. It's not great. It's okay. 
uh, R squared of 0.91. So this is sort of uh, a somewhat classical approach to constructing the emulator task is what I'm the terminology I'm using here. And I'm going to call this the total error emulator because I'm just using one emulator to predict this total error. An alternative way to set up this uh, workflow, and I'm just changing the order of operations here, um, would be to first define our observational targets, LAI, um, define that spatial and temporal aggregation, still using the biome, but then I jump right in and train an emulator. Um, so in this case, I'm training an emulator to predict the biome level LAI, and I do that for each biome, so tropical rainforest, um, temperate rainforest, boreal forest, tundra, each, I relate the input parameter space to the leaf area index in each individual biome. And by doing this, I'm preserving some of the unique relationships between that input parameter space and the biome specific um, um, ecological function. So I end up with nine different emulators, one for each biome. And then I can use the emulated leaf area index uh, for to plug into my error metric and, and, and also to calculate my cost function. These are identical. So I've really just changed the order of operations here. Um, but one thing I want to point out before I move on is that in the first case, uh, I'm trying to minimize this cost function. And so I'm you know, looking for parameter sets that are down here by zero. I want them to have zero error. So I'm actually pushing up against an edge of um, my training data. I train the emulator on, it's all gonna be positive because of my uh, cost function metric, um, but I'm pushing towards the edge of my training data space. Whereas in this case, you know, the optimal uh, value is somewhere within in the middle of my training data space. Um, I'm, because I'm not training to an error, I'm training to the actual LAI. And so that actually makes it a somewhat easier um, task for the emulator because I'm not asking it to extrapolate. Okay, so um, just comparing these two approaches, um, we have the total error emulator, R squared that was port 9.1, I already showed this. Um, and then when I use the nine different biome level emulators, um, the total cost function error, um, the R squared is around 0.92. So pretty similar, you know, I'm not, neither of these are great. They're not terrible, um, but they're similar. And so I may not expect when I run, use these two methods and I run them through the calibration, I may not expect um, two different of results because I expect the uh, emulator performance to be similar. So that's what I'm going to do. We're going to test it out. And to test that, um, we first take a large uh, sample from the input parameter space. And then using the two different methods, ask the emulators to predict um, what the error is, the cost function, um, and then identify parameter sets within this sample that fall within our observational tolerance. In this case, I have 25 ensemble members that passed this, that are with, oops, sorry, that are within the observational tolerance um, for each different method. And then I ran CLM with uh, those 25 new, better parameter sets. Um, and we'll see how they look. Um, so here's our results, our initial ensemble. Um, using the Latin hypercube sampling, I'm just showing the total cost function error on the Y. Um, our initial spread looks something like this. We have 500 ensemble members. Some had really high error, some are very low. This dashed line is our observational tolerance. So anything below that, we had a few ensemble mem members that are below, that fall within our observational tolerance. Um, but when we use the total error um, emulator, it gave us you know, 25 parameter sets that we thought should improve the model. And when we ran them back through CLM, none of them were actually, um, none of them actually improved the model. They were all outside of our observational tolerance. 
However, when we use the biome specific um, emulators, uh, uh, almost half of the uh, parameter sets that we thought should be good um, were actually within our, our observational tolerance. Um, and so I can talk a little bit about why this is, but I think um, we're because we're preserving some of the uh, physical nature between the input parameter space and the um, biome LAI, when we construct that emulation task, it's an easier uh, task for the emulator to do. And we're actually then getting um, a more robust um, output. And so uh, for the sake of time, I'm just going to jump to my uh, takeaways here. Um, so I think what we learned from this type of very simple experiment is that um, constructing the emulation task to relate parameters directly to the model output is going to be key, right? We don't want to build up a complex compound error function and then try to emulate that error function because that's just a really hard emulation task. Sure, we can we can use better methods, different emulators, and work um, on improving emulator performance, but it's actually pretty low hanging fruit to just uh, design really simple emulation tasks and then use this ensemble of emulators. And we saw that using an ensemble of emulators that each perform a very simple task well can actually um, be a better, uh, give us better results in our calibration. So I think this is a fairly intuitive point that I'm making to folks who do this, this work. Um, you know, there's so much information in our model output that we lose when we take a root mean squared error, for example. Um, but I think we can think more critically about preserving some of that information um, and that will help us um, improve our calibrations. So we're going to, our next steps are to then extend this approach. We wanna take it to the PFT level, um, maybe try it out on grid cells. You know, if these are cheap, why not have an emulator for every grid cell? I don't know if that's a good idea yet or not. We're just trying that out. Um, we're going to add metrics and variables and explore other em emulation tools. And we heard other folks talk today about um, the importance of uh, antecedent conditions on ecosystem function. And so a long short-term model might be able to preserve some of that um, information uh, in, and encode it into our emulation tests. Um, so with that, I'll wrap up and take questions if there are any.